right, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. I'm Lori Factor, president of the Youngstown Press Club. Um, welcome to the Youngstown Press Club's February Speakers Series event. Uh, thanks for spending your lunch with us. I'd like to uh, first thank those who worked so hard to make sure our series became a reality. Uh, that is Diane Fitzpatrick, who's our executive director, Joanne Kalerick, where's Joanne? There's Joanne, who amazingly puts all of these events together, working with the venues and the caterers and, and uh, what have you. And then uh, we also have Elise Skolnick here. We have George Nelson, Jordan Cohen. Am I missing any board member? Oh, Tony. Hi, Tony. Tony Paglia, sorry. <laughs> you, you slipped in and I didn't see you. So uh, all of the board was really so gracious and, and their ideas were so wonderful when we were putting together this uh, speaker series and we hope that you enjoy it as the, the year comes on. Uh, Concept Studio has been a really nice venue for us and Mocha House always keeps us fed, so we also appreciate uh, that. I am gonna do one thing that is housekeeping in, uh, in relation, and that is to remind you that next Thursday, February 22nd at Dior, we'll welcome Wall Street Journal editor Paul Beckett uh, to discuss the wrongful imprisonment in Russia of their reporter, Evan Gershkovich. This is a pivotal event for our club, and so we have worked so hard behind the scenes for months to get Paul here, to have the rest of the world understand the importance of uh, what happens when a journalist is wrongfully detained, wrongfully imprisoned. So anytime that you can spread for us between now and, uh, and uh, next week, I do understand that there have been some issues with the uh, the link, and so uh, we're going to address that this afternoon, and I will send out another email to members just letting you know that, you know, it's go time and the, and the link is there. All right, so you know there's always a Youngstown connection, right, right? We all know that. So Mike McIntyre and I hit it out of the ballpark with this one because we're practically family. All right, so stay, stay with me here. You're going to have to stay. Mike's wife, Elizabeth, a Youngstown gal, is my first cousin Sharon's husband's sister, okay? So there, there will be, right, right, right. So we have partied at a few events and um, a few events back in the day dealing with baptisms and first communions and things like that. So it makes us family. And I'm delighted to welcome Mike back to the Valley. He's a Bowling Green alum. Camille is also a Bowling Green alum. Uh, he spent 30 years as a reporter, feature writer, Sunday Magazine staffer, and Metro columnist for The Plain Dealer, where he also wrote about stand-up comedy for The Friday Magazine. In 2010, Mike took over hosting duties for The Sound of Ideas, WKSU's daily public affairs talk show, a position he held for 10 years. Mike became executive editor of IdeaStream Public Media in 2020 and continues to host the Friday Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable on WKSU and Ideas on WVIZ. He's had some success along the way here and there, uh, receiving the Herb Kane. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay, thank you, because I actually had to Google that because I wanted to make sure I said that uh, correctly. Uh, the Herb Kane Memorial Award from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists in 2010, induction into the Journalism Hall of Fame by the Press Club of Cleveland in 2016, and as a member of Leadership Cleveland Class of 2022. Mike's going to talk about building a regional public media newsroom. So please help me welcome my kissing cousin, Mike McIntyre. Okay. I am going to apologize in advance for this because it's really going to be boring. Um, you had Henry Gomez here. Uh, last year, I don't know if you guys are there, great guy, I hear it was a great speech. Do not compare me to that. 
Um, some of it Lori said, but, um, uh, but I, I kind of wrote some things out. I'm a radio guy. I've got a script, so I'm going to follow it. So you'll hear some of this stuff again. Um, I am happy to be back in a place that, by marriage, I consider a second hometown. Um, and that's right, I did. I married a valley girl. She's Youngstown through and through. She's beautiful and ferocious, and she has but one flaw. She roots for the Steelers. Uh -huh. yes. I, I don't get it. We are from Ohio. We're together. We make steel, too. Maybe it's all the winning that she likes. I don't know. But we're not allowed to watch Brown Steelers games together. We never do. And I've finally gotten over the fact that when the Browns moved to Baltimore and we didn't have a team, she bought my son a Steelers sweatshirt. He was born in 98. So this little baby has a sweatshirt. I'm proud to say he's only worn it once. He didn't put it on himself. <laughs> he's a Browns fan. I don't know if you guys listened to Crooked City, um, that podcast. What a, what a great podcast. And it was all about the history of mafia activity in Youngstown. And my wife was not involved in the assassination attempt of Paul Gaines. <laughs> but she did go to elementary and high school with the man who shot him. So what I'm saying is that she knows people, <laughs> and it keeps me in line. I don't have her history here, but Youngstown does feel in many ways like home for me. I started visiting Youngstown in the late 80s when Elizabeth Kimes, that was her name then, she took McIntyre, I didn't make her, um, wasn't, part, wasn't my decision. Uh, she was a Cardinal Mooney girl, and she'd come home for the holidays, so I came to visit. And we worked together uh, at the Plain Dealer. She was a manager and editor, I was a reporter. We married in 91. Um, she grew up on Judson Avenue, which is right near, near uh, South and Midlothian. Sadly, the house is gone now, her parents are gone too, and the neighborhood has seen better days. And still, I do still love Youngstown. I've played bocce at Cassis's MVR. Uh, I've golfed at Mill Creek. Uh, I enjoyed countless scoops, as you can see, of chocolate pecans served from the window of Handles <laughs> at Market in Midlothian, the original. It's way before they built the bougie one two minutes from me in Rocky River. <laughs> I know that Wedgwood has the best Briar Hill pizza, although some of you may say Uptown does. Yeah, I knew it. And I was married in St. Dom's by a Dominican priest who inexplicably called me by my middle name during the entire ceremony. <laughs> my wife married a guy named Kevin. <laughs> and I don't know if that makes it a valid marriage. <laughs> 33 years, two kids later, I hope so. My good friend, as I mentioned, uh, NBC's Henry Gomez, Youngstown State grad, he spoke to you last year and I asked him how it went and what I should do. And, this is directly quoted from his text message to me. He said, my speech was basically just name dropping every anchor and writer I grew up watching and reading. <laughs> Half of them were in the audience. <laughs> so what I've done now is drop Henry's name, so I get that credit. I have one more. I sat at a table at the wedding reception of former Plain Dealer Browns writer, Tony Grossi, who's now in radio. And I sat at the table with his friend, Stan Boney, so weatherman extraordinaire forever at channel 33, now an anchor at channel 27. So there's another name I just dropped. Also, Carmen Policy was at the wedding. But sa sadly, there was no cookie table. Um, I am excited to tell you about my work in public media. The efforts we're making at IdeaStream, this is going to be the boring part, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all about that. But our efforts to build a regional news operation worthy of the public's trust. And I can tell you right now, we're not anywhere near our goal and where we are hoping to go. We're learning as we go. Um, I believe that those who watch us and listen to us and read us and trust us, and we've done some surveying on this, I believe that they do trust us, that they, the people that know about us uh, appreciate what it is we do. The problem is not enough people know about us, and that's what our mission is now, is to, to grow and to expand, to become more regional and to make sure that people know that we're here and then eventually to ask for their support. And I'll talk about that model as we go along uh, in a minute. I do have uh, to talk for a half hour here, so let me start by talking a little more about who is doing the talking, my story, not just the Youngstown cred. I transitioned to the role I'm in now just four years ago after 30 years at the Plain Dealer. Uh, a lot of it beside this man, Tom Breckenridge, who is a, a co-worker of mine for many years and beats me on the golf course every Sunday as well. <laughs> Didn't know you were gonna be here. Um, I, uh, I got a chance to write a Metro column there. It was great. Bertram D'Souza, I was not, but I did my best. All right, that's my last name drop, everybody. 
I graduated from BG in 87, started my career at the Lorraine Journal. It was a scrappy newspaper, or still is, battling uh, outside of Cleveland, battling every day for dominance against the Illyria Chronicle Telegram. And amazingly, after all the upheaval in this business, that's still the case. The journal, though, is a shell of itself, as most newspapers and their websites are. And you all know what happened to the Vindy. Those who remain in this business doing the work that we do, uh, doing the work that two and three and four of us used to do, are heroes. They're worthy of our support and admiration. A free and robust press, despite what you hear from some in the political sphere, is essential to our democracy. That includes newspapers, commercial TV and radio, nonprofit, online startups, legacy media organizations, and public media organizations like mine and WISU, which mostly does classical, right? Yeah, still worthy of support, it's an NPR station. Uh, by 1990, I, along with Elizabeth, who had been a copy editor in Lorraine while I covered City Hall, moved on to the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, and it's two journalists married to one another, who else would have us, right? Tom and Mary Beth know the, <laughs> that as well. Um, by the way, she's president of the Press Club of Cleveland, uh, Elizabeth is now, she had been the publisher and editor of Crane's Cleveland Business, now uh, taking a break and, and going to look to her next up, but she's spending a lot of time at the press club, and she told me to tell all of you that applications are, are now open for the All Ohio Excellence in Journalism Awards, so get your people to apply there, uh, pressclubcleveland.com. Tom, let her know I said it, so we're good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, she stayed at the PD, rising to assistant managing editor for news for 20 years before moving on to the role I just told you about at Cranes. I stayed for 30 at the PD, never, not once, wanting to edit a damn thing. I wanted to write news, I wanted to make features sing, I wanted to bring out a sharp knife and sometimes a can of laughing gas to produce my column. But I was always open to new assignments, new experiences, the opportunity to learn new skills, computer-assisted journalism, narrative storytelling. Hell, I even found it a challenge to do the cliched weather story in a new, new way. Nude way would be interesting too, <laughs> frankly. Um, I delved into sports for the 95, 97, and 2016 World Series appearances by the then Indians, writing the page one piece that drove the faithful into the sports section and told the casual fan all they needed to know. I was gonna have my page one story on every bar room wall in Cleveland, and maybe a few of the non-pirates bars in Youngstown in 97 until Edgar Renteria of Jim Leland's Marlins singled up the middle off Charlie Nagy, scoring Craig Council and ruining my hopes and dreams. I was able to forget all about that and move on right afterward, though. That's not, it hasn't stayed with me. And I won't even get started on the rain delay in game seven of the 2016 series against the Cubs. I covered a variety of news beats over 30 years, had a stint in a Sunday magazine writing 10,000 word profiles, and when I got a chance to do radio, uh, an interview on the local NPR station about one of my stories, I said, why not? And the interview, afterward, the host was very complimentary. He said, you seem to be able to hand yourself behind a microphone. And I told him, I do like to talk, which you guys now know. <laughs> and she's, he says, great, I'm on vacation next week, why don't you fill in? I'd had no radio experience whatsoever. And so it began. I showed up and I sat in the chair and I did his job for a week, probably very poorly. I don't even want to go back and listen to the tapes. But I worked for about a year filling in for Dan Maltrop, who's now the CEO of the City Club of Cleveland. And whenever he took off, I would jump in and, and take over his shift. And no pay, just learning a skill, learning how to do something. And it paid off. Uh, for a while, I was doing that with no pay, as I mentioned. And then um, he left for a new job. And I jumped in and said, all right, I wonder if I can do this full time. And I got the plane dealer to agree to let me stay there full time host the Sound of Ideas part-time and get paid for it. And so that's how this sort of transition into public media happened. And I tell everybody who's ever listened to me for 10 years in their car as they're going to work and I'm doing my show, but we've never met in person, it's okay, I thought I'd be taller too. I did, I thought I would be taller too. <laughs> um, by 2020, with the pandemic just beginning, the PD and Cleveland.com were ready to make some more painful cuts and the executive editor job right then had opened up at IdeaStream. So my vow to et never edit a damn thing was over. I took my layoff and my buyout, thank you, Newspaper Guild, and I slid into this new job, <coughs> sorry, using a, a management muscle I'd never once exercised. Four years in, I think I've got the hang of it, but there's so much learn to learn from my colleagues, from others in the business, from the people that work with me, and from all of you as well. So our organization owns a PBS station, 
WBIZ, an NPR member station, WKSU, a classical music station, WCLB, and a new jazz HD and streaming station that's launching in less than two weeks, Jazz Neo. We also have a very newsy website updated throughout the day uh, called ideastream.org. My purview is the news, mostly concentrating on the radio station and website, and to a lesser extent, the PBS station. We don't do a nightly local news show. The four commercial stations devoting hours each day to local news have all that covered. But our radio and website focus when I took over the job was to cover Cleveland and its close environs. We delved outside of that occasionally, but our bread and butter was whatever moved in Cleveland. Months into my tenure, though, we began to think bigger as we planned a major merger with WKSU. So at the time, we were WCPN Cleveland. WKSU was a completely separate NPR station, also doing the same kind of coverage with a whole lot of signal overlap. So we started having some talks with Kent State University, and the merger was announced in October of 2021. We essentially took over all the operations of WKSU, all the news, all the business. The university remains the license holder for WKSU signal. And we switched our signal to WKSU to 89.7 from 90.3. And we have a number of repeater stations as well that spread that out. There are some spots in Cleveland where it's not as clear as it was before. That is the bane of our existence. We're trying to work on that. There's FCC issues you have to deal with. But essentially, we took that new signal because if you think of a circle starting in Kent, it comes down to Cleveland. If you think of a circle starting in Cleveland, half of it goes into the lake. And so that wasn't the best signal for us. We got a much more robust signal with the repeaters, 22 counties that we're hitting now, which is why I need to be more regional. It meant integrating a small staff of terrific journalists at WKSU, and I mean small. There were maybe four people at that point. The university had not been filling uh, open seats. It was a money loser for, for the school. Uh, been doing that to work with our people at WCPN. I was filling positions the university hadn't filled. Um, and initially paying close attention to Cleveland, Akron, and Canton. That was our immediate plan. Meanwhile, we had to develop a strategy to cover more news to be a presence in the 22 counties that our signal now reaches. And about the hiring, I made it a point to look for great reporters, not necessarily radio or public media reporters. I feel like all of us who've been reporters, if you know how to ask the question, if you know where the story is, if you know what a nut graph is, I'll give you a microphone and teach you how to talk into it. And, and that's basically what we've done. So I've hired people that work for Report for America, radio, digital operations, several newspaper people, and it's always worked out great. It's a little more effort on our part, but it's worth it. So how do you build a regional public media newsroom? If anyone here knows the answer to that, would you let me know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it started with our board to explain public media stations like ours, where a dual licensee, radio and television, are governed by a board of directors made up of community members, usually bigwig community members, but they're people who are also very passionate about public media. And the board worked with our top managers to develop what is our North Star, which is to spread our trustworthy news and information services to more Northeast Ohioans. The point I made earlier, if you know us, you'll like us, or love us, hopefully but more people need to know who we are. Uh, before we get to how, let me address the why. We believe the communities of Northeast Ohio need the journalism we can provide. We've all seen what has happened to the media landscape, not just in the last decade, but in the last year alone. We have a proven, sustainable model, and we believe the more people hear us and know about us, the more they'll trust us, and we hope see the value in supporting us. And it makes sense. We strive to cover a broader area where there are more people who can potentially help to fund the expansion and improve their community by having better information. And so where others might be drawing back and cutting their economic models, forcing their hand, we're looking to continue growing by building a bond with those who value us. You can get it for free, but so many people still pay because they see the value of it. And also because we beg on pledge drives and give them a tote bag. <laughs> You've heard criticism about public media. Elon Musk has NPR labeled state-run media on Twitter before NPR decided not to be part of that platform anymore, and it's not true. IdeaStream is an independent nonprofit, and the biggest chunk of our funding, by far nearly 40%, comes from the public by way of donations. They are partners and members, and you might have to sit through the pledge drive, as I said, but it works. But even still, only about one in 20 people who uses our stations pays for it. If we could make that two, 
just two out of 20, double it, we'd be setting up bureaus in 22 counties. We also make money from underwriting. They're basically ads, but we call it underwriting because there's no call to action, uh, and on television, they don't interrupt the programming, but they're underwriting. It's corporate sponsors who will tell you about the, the foundation that they run or the business that they, they're in. We are in corporate and foundation support, uh, funding often specific areas, but with zero say in how we cover it, and that's essential. It's not, I'll give you money and then we'll tell you how to cover it. So for example, the Burton D. Morgan Foundation funds entrepreneurial coverage, and they just said, we'd love you to do stories about entrepreneurs. In fact, Tom is a freelancer for us, and we've hired a number of freelancers, all locally controlled. We decide what's a story and what isn't. Um, and their fees are paid for by that Morgan grant. So that's another example of how the, the multifaceted funding that we employ, which is what I think has allowed us to be sustainable. We have an endowment that contributes to our bottom line. We have some earned income as well, and we get money from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. There's the government. This is where we're talking about what Elon Musk calls state-run media. Congress funds the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and it amounts to less than 10% street. Most of it is used to pay dues and fees to NPR and PBS. So we're not a network. NPR doesn't own us, doesn't tell me how to cover news, doesn't set policy that I have to follow. What they do is sell us programs, and we purchase Morning Edition, all things considered. We also purchase programming from other public media services uh, and others that are not public media, like the New York Times, and we, we air the Daily every day, and we pay for that. All, mostly, most of the money from Corporation Public Broadcasting pays for that programming, that national programming, that we then put around that all of our local news. So when we do a news break in the morning, you'll hear at the top of the hour, national NPR news. It could go in, in some stations for a whole six minutes or seven minutes because that's the news. But you'll hear at one point there, they'll say, this is NPR news. Stations that don't have local news then just let it keep playing. We jump in and cover it with our local news. And so that's how we get top and bottom of the hour all day local news coverage, which takes a big staff to do. We did a survey recently to the point I was bringing up earlier, an extensive one, and I think expensive one. And it showed people who know who we are are very complimentary of what we do. They like our storytelling, and that was gratifying. But I wish I hadn't turned to page two, and that's what the problem was. It was barely anybody knows about us. And certainly our core of people do, but as we get further out, we need to change that equation. Some of that is marketing. They have a job to do. And some of it is the newsroom, too. So. The other question we asked in that survey, which I thought was really interesting and part of the crux to what I'm talking about today, is what is local news? Because we always hear this, you know, local news is really important, national news is important as well, but we don't have enough local news. We have other outlets that can do national. When we asked people how they define local news, they didn't say their block or their neighborhood or even their suburb or their main city. They said the region. When we said, what do you think local news is, they said it's news from Northeast Ohio. And so I, it makes me believe that if we are able to connect and do a great story uh, from Camel, it will be interesting to somebody who is in North Ridgeville if, if we do this right. And so in my view, regional is local. So that's the why, the how, another great question. We started by being intentional about the task and doing something deadline news reporters like me have a lot of trouble with, strategic planning. Oh, we asked our staff to weigh in, and if you ask 40 journalists for an opinion, you're likely to get 42 opinions. We talked through all of that with our staff, a bunch of meetings. We arrived at a definition of regional news coverage that all of us could agree on. In the short, it wouldn't be, hey, we've got to put a bureau in every city. It can't do it. We don't have the manpower. What it arrived at in the short version is IdeaStream's regional news tells stories that matter to people across Northeast Ohio by making connections and finding stories and sources from all 22 counties. Not every story that we report can make connections across every community in our region, but our team's knowledge and expertise will allow us to find those stories, illustrate why they're relevant to the broader region. So that's what we're trying to do. As I said, it's a work in progress. We developed a, this strategic plan, and we're lucky that one of the newsroom leaders from KSU just got her master's in strategic planning. And it's specific about the steps we're taking to reach across the region. It has deliverables that we report out each quarter. It makes my head want to explode. But strategic planning and regular check-ins for accountability works, and it keeps us on task. 
We started physically by creating a bureau responsible for Akron and areas south of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, including Canton. And we tapped the previous WKSU news director, now the deputy editor for news on my staff, to manage that bureau. We hired a new reporter with experience in the region. We transferred another from our health unit to cover local news and government in Akron and Canton. Luckily, she's from Canton, so it was a perfect fit. We've got that local knowledge. We ramped up our internship program with Kent State University School of Journalism. We actually started paying the interns, which is great. We have three or four interns per semester. They do stories for the web and radio, and it's never make work. They're, they're doing journalism. And the Bureau has space at Kent State University at the moment. I'm in the process of devising a plan for a much more visible headquarters in downtown Akron. And we know we can't do this alone with exi existing staff. So we made a plea for freelance money and grant funding, and I seek freelancers in counties we aren't in on a daily basis. We reached out to form relationships with other media, those remaining heroes that I talked about. And we talk to new media as well. We collaborate with them. And sometimes it's just a, hey, I know who you are. Give me a call if there's a big story and you think it's interesting. Or I've called the editor of the Illyria Chronicle Telegram and said, you've got a major issue with a veterans homeless center. We want to put it on our program. Can we get your reporter to, to join? That's, that's a small way of doing that. A bigger way is with the Akron Beacon Journal and the Akron Press Club. We collaborated to fund, develop, and jointly report on a survey of Summit County residents ahead of last year's elections. And then we produced two debates in the Akron mayor's race that we broadcast on television and radio, covered extensively on our websites. But we all got together about how we're going to formulate the questions, who's going to ask them. And, and an actually cool part of that was we decided the public would ask them. So we asked the public, what do you want to ask? And literally had them come in, stand up, and ask their question. If they couldn't make it, we did, a, we did a video and put that up on the screen. So that's one of the ways that we've been able to have these relationships. We talk regional all the time with our staff. Our monthly staff meeting features recognition for an excellent job covering a regional story. And then the staffer is asked to share how they thought about it, how they came up with it, what they did, just ways that we can learn. One of our multimedia journalists has essentially made a beat out of communities and homes in Stark counties, covers a lot of the Amish community as well. Our arts team covers all kinds of arts and music from across the region, and people light up when they find a great story in a county they don't usually visit. It's, it's becoming part of our culture. We're in talks about partnering with a number of other media outlets as, uh, in Northeast Ohio as a new way to reach out to the community on issues important to them this election season. And then we'll cover those issues. We're taking questions and sub suggestions from the public through a consortium of public media organizations called Ampl America Amplified. We hope to have a booth at the Trumbull County Fair to engage with folks there about what they need to know during election season. And who knows, maybe we'll make it to Canfield too. Some other steps we've taken, and again, they're not all answers, they're experiments. Our reporters worried about feeding the daily beast of daily news while also having time to, oh, I'm going to go out to the hinterlands and write some really amazing story and broadcast it and do in-depth and create driveway moments, which if you're an NPR listener, you might know what it is, but if you pull into your driveway and the story is halfway done and you sit in your car until it's finished and then you get into the house, that's, that's it. That's what we want. We want driveway moments. So how do we free our reporters up to do that? We do that by establishing, we did this in 2020 when I came into this job, a dedicated newscast unit. We elevated one of our hosts to lead it, and it consists of three talented hosts who deliver the news throughout the day, an associate producer and a supervising producer. And their job is all up to the minute, urgent news, whatever's news. Reporters will feed them short stories. Newscasts are only two and a half minutes long. They'll also roll on DeWine talking somewhere and they'll pull the whatever news might come out of that or ignore it if there isn't news. But we get up to the minute urgent news at the top and bottom of the hour with that unit, which frees our reporters up to, yes, cover the big stories on their beats, but then have the time to look for those broader stories to get a few days to work on a feature, or in some cases, even a few weeks. We created a dedicated digital team, moving the news director to a new role of deputy editor digital. Uh, we have a social media producer, a web editor, who also is an eagle eye photographer. They integrate with the rest of the newsroom to make sure our digital efforts aren't afterthoughts. So each division, the health team, the arts and culture, the talk show folks, the news people, all have somebody with digital in their title, and they coordinate through this digital team to make sure that we're 
really paying attention not just to our website. We're mostly trying Instagram. We do post on, on X, Twitter, and we post on Facebook too, but we're doing original content for Instagram and we're seeing all kinds of results from that. And we're hoping, again, we want people to, to see it, to know the quality of it, and then eventually to support us based on that. And these are all the different avenues. There was a time when we, we uh, our station, took radio scripts and basically shoved them into a content management system, no picture, and that was a web story. That's not the case anymore. Our team, we've won best news uh, website for the last couple of years for radio, and it competes with any local newspaper website you'd see. It's ideastream.org. Um, so we're really paying attention to the digital space, and that's another way for us to, to be able to take in regional stories. We start an engaged journalism unit, and their goal is to get out into the community across all 22 counties to hear from people about what their needs are and either tell their stories or in many cases, and I love this even more, to work with them to tell their own stories. Uh, one initiative called The Sound of Us gets out into the community and, and then kids will, we had one where it was children, they did reporting from their high school. One kid wanted to know how come there was no recycling program in their high school, so they hung out by the garbage can with a microphone and talk to these kids about why you're throwing this pop bottle away and then essentially went to the principal and got a recycling program started at their school. But that was their story, their voice. And so we want to just be a facilitator of that. It's another way to do that. And, and to be regional, that was a Cleveland story. Our next series of stories coming out later this month are about farmers across Northeast Ohio region and, and the struggles that family farms are facing. Uh, one of the things they have is, is uh, uh, besetting the media industry as well. It's getting young people interested and involved. So we'll have uh, one story where the person is talking about that. Uh, the daily talk show I used to host, The Sound of Ideas, now has a much more regional gaze where topics come from all over. And when we have universal topics like death and taxes and potholes, we'll seek to broaden it with experts and guests who aren't in our area code. We don't, I have a great Rolodex of people I've talked to over the last 35 years, but I try not to call them anymore because I want to call new people that we don't know. It's a way to be diverse in our region. It's also a way for us to get more diversity on our air. You know, often the people that you've talked to from 30 years ago are going to be white males. And so if you want to reach out, there's a, there's a way to do that. And we have a source list database that we put together. And we're now going to get a, a new process where reporters, when they interview someone, have four questions at the end to ask them. And they're demographic questions. One of them is, where do you live? So that we can take a heat map and say, we're talking to everybody in Summit and Cuyahoga County. We've got to get out into Wayne and Holmes and do some other of that work. But it also will, uh, people have the choice to identify, but it'll let us know, are we talking to all white people? Are we talking to this type of person or that? What kind of variety are we giving to our audience? And the way to do that is to measure it and to, and to then take action on it. And then we're also taking advantage of what COVID gave us, um, the hybrid work from home schedule. As I always say, there's no news in the newsroom. So I love it when people are out getting the news. But I also do like the serendipity and the coffee pot conversations and discussing stuff with your fellow colleagues. And we do that to some extent, but many of our folks will spend at least three days, at least two days, often three, working from home. And what that gives us is wherever they live, we have a presence. So I actually have a producer who lives south of Bolivar. I don't know if you know where that is, but it is way the hell away from Cleveland. It's like you go to Canton and then you keep going. And she drives, she used to drive in every day, and now she has the privilege and the, the, the benefit of working from home. She comes in on Fridays because that's the show. She's my producer for the show that I do. But every other day she's at home. Well, having been there, it's in Tuscarawas County, when that Tuskegee Valley High School bus crash happened and four students were killed and a chaperone and a teacher, I had a reporter at Tuskegee Valley High School in one minute. She lived around the corner. So, you know, do we have a bureau there? But no, but do we take advantage of the fact that our people are there? And I've got folks that are in Stark, Summit, Lorraine, Lake, uh, all kinds of other counties. So work from home actually helps us with our regional gaze. On, ear, on air, we're clear with our language, or we try to be, so people know that if they're listening, we're not for someone else or someplace else. I was really trying to get it done before you left, Matt. That's all right. <laughs> Matt has walked out. He's been a guest on our show, and he's walked out on me several times. <laughs> I grew up in Youngstown. My favorite story is my, well, not favorite. My uncle was killed by a car. Oh, oh wow. That's, oh, that's, 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 that
Well, there's a high note. Should, should we just end it with that? So that, that's Matt Cox, he's the communications guy in Cleveland from Youngstown. All right, um, on air, we're clear with our language. We wanna let people know that we're for them, we're of them, and so we don't say downtown. You know, down, this happened downtown yesterday. What downtown are you talking about? How many downtowns are there in 22 counties? And so we don't do that. We are specific about what we're talking about. And we try to be, again, we don't always wanna say downtown Cleveland. We wanna do stories in other downtowns. When we give the weather, it's real simple, but we mention what the temperature is in other cities you might live in. So you'll hear that and know it's not just what's happening on the lakefront. Same with traffic. Usually it's Cleveland and Akron, but if we, our gaze is a little bit broader than that. Finally, there's a philosophy as an executive editor that I have that I would have loved if all of my editors had with me when I was reporting, and it comes from improv. Um, and it's yes and. So I'll give you an example. If we're in uh, improv and we're on stage, and you say, oh no, it's raining. And I say, no, it's not raining. The bit is over, right? That killed it. But if I reply, yes, and the top is down on the convertible, and you say, and grandma's in the back seat, and she gets really mad when she's wet. Well, now we're off and running. We're gonna have something funny that we're gonna talk about. So it's yes and. My philosophy on story ideas, project ideas, basically any ideas, is yes and. It's idea stream, I mean, yes and. Yes, pursue that story. You'll be passionate about it, do it. And remember, we have other obligations to the audience. You may have to do something else first or concurrently, but yes, by all means, pursue the stories you're passionate about. Make sure to find that common thread that everyone in our region will feel passionately about too. And that's what it all comes down to for me and for IdeaStream. We are passionate about informing, entertaining, and strengthening our community. Yes, we'll do that, and we're gonna continue. And that's what I got. Questions. I, or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would happen? Two things. First of all, I'm very impressed that you pronounced camel correctly. <laughs> yes. Second of all, I was really struck when you said if we could double our membership, we could expand so much. And that seems very doable if we can get a grassroots kind of approach to it. I just wondered if you'd given any thought to how we as IdeaStream members could encourage or recruit or inspire others to become members. Um, there are a number of ways, and it's really funny. I had a conversation, there's a guy who's applying to be um, the guy who would do that, a, a membership marketing guy for IdeaStream. He wanted to have lunch because I knew him back in high school. And his idea was, you know, I'm a member, why don't I get a neighbor to be a member. And if we all did that, you know, we'd be fine. Yeah, I think that's that's a good strategy. A little out of my realm because we're I'm trying to stay in the newsroom, but I'd you know love for the for the folks whose business it is to do that, to think of some of those things. They are working hard to come up with all kinds of different ideas to let people know if you're already listening, just those who are listening, if you decide to become a member, and a member by the way is not necessarily expensive. I mean we have what we call idea leaders, which I'm sure you are. Um, uh, idea leaders are the are the folks that, are the folks that give 100 bucks a month, so they give 1,200 dollars in a year, and they'll get benefits like when Scott Simon comes to town, they get to come and, and go to a thing. But many of the folks that that support us will give 50 bucks for the year, and if every bit of it counts, if all of those people did, the the news budget would be much bigger. So, I like the idea. If you've got any more. Um, I'd love to. Just on how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, shame is one way. Shame is one way. You're listening to that station. You don't even pay. You know, I think about all the ways we try to say it on the air when we're when we're making pledge, and people like pledge because it's just it's like a, a it's a horror show that you have to listen to, and you're like, how is he going to say this again? Like, I'll listen to it all day because I can't wait to hear how someone's going to frame the next thing. But often we'll say things like, you know, hey, you like the Starbucks, don't you? Well, you're paying three fifty a day for Starbucks. How about if you just do five bucks a week for Idea Stream? Um, you know, those are kind of some of the arguments that you make and, and you hope resonate with those who are, who are already there and listening. And by the way, not everybody can afford to give a thing, and I understand that. It's not like I'm saying, 
you know, if you listen, you're a deadbeat if you don't give. People, everyone has their own circumstances. But if you could afford it, um, and you find it valuable enough to listen to, and especially if you're somebody that's listening every day, you probably should pony up for it. And it would be great to have that happen. Yes, sir. So Cleveland's about 43 miles from Canton. Youngstown's about 39. But our uh, signal isn't quite as good. You can't get you in downtown Youngstown. Uh, you can get you about halfway up South Avenue, and uh, once you're into Boardman, you're doing fine. It takes it all the way to the border, by the way. Um, that was number one. And uh, number two was, uh, because Youngstown is just as close as Cleveland, I can't remember the last time I heard a Youngstown story on an idea stream, and I listen all day. Right. So um, one of the things you mentioned is where the signal reaches, and I'll need to check on that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is I told you that this is a work in progress and we're just beginning. And so, yes, we have not covered Youngstown. We have covered Warren uh, with several stories. And, and I think part of it is not just what you're hearing on the air, but you'll see on our website as well. So the Burton D. Morgan stories I mentioned are mainly web stories. And we've had a couple of stories about um, business incubator here in Youngstown, uh, something that's going on in uh, Warren, some business stories in Warren. Um, as well. We also did a bunch of stories about um, Dave Grohl, but that's a completely different thing. Yeah. Number three, um, I'm amazed at your ambition and work ethic. Uh, you went from name, I don't know, 30 different programs you have going on at the moment. Uh, what drug particularly do you <laughs> to do that? Uh, well, I, I couldn't get qualified, but I need Ozempic, apparently. Um, I actually drink decaf, too. Um, it, uh, I, I'm excited by it. I'm jazzed by it. And I've got a boss uh, who's our, um, our chief content officer who is just, he loves strategic planning, and then he also loves the part of it that I like doing, which is the creating the journalism part of it. I think it's a culture that we're starting to build where people are really excited about what we do. And what's different from the plane dealer, which I loved, and I have no bad words for it. As I said, everybody that remains is a hero that's working in the business. But to me, it felt there not the same way as it feels in public media, where my number one goal is to strengthen the community. My number one goal is to get the community what it needs. And I think that's a driving thing for everybody that works there, that we have a sense of mission that's different from selling mattress ads. No offense to mattress companies. Everyone needs one. Mike, what was your biggest challenge when you integrated WKSU into the idea stream model? There were, there were a, no, a number of them. One is culture. WKSU was a scrappy, smaller station that competed with us that sometimes won the awards we thought we should have won, and they were very proud of that. So there was a, a, an idea that we weren't big-footing them. And so to integrate folks into the job, we had somebody that hosted All Things Considered for them and someone that hosted Morning Edition, and both of them have different jobs now. But it was because the new jobs fit them better, not because we didn't think they were good at it. But there was a lot of making sure people knew where you were coming from when it came to that. That's on the manpower part of it. The other part is you mentioned you don't get the signal in downtown Youngstown. When we made the, the merge, we weren't getting the signal in downtown Cleveland. And, and the people who listened from Cleveland were pissed because they listened to their station. Now they think their station has gone away. So there was a sense in Kent that they're losing a local station because Cleveland's taking it over. And then a sense in Cleveland that they lost their local station because the signal's not strong. And so we had a lot of work to do. And I think we've convinced the people in Akron, Canton, and Kent that we're here to stay, that our staff is bigger and more robust, that we have great reporters. And we've fixed the signal, at least in downtown Cleveland. There are boosters you can put on these towers, I'm told. And if I could just turn them all up to 11, everyone would hear us. But then we'd bleed over everyone else's signal and we get in trouble. So the FCC has some rules about that. We also go into Canada over the lake if we go too far. So they don't let you get as strong as you want to do there. So we're pointing uh, antennas and trying to get the signal better. That was another big challenge. And it's the one we still hear about today. If somebody is in a little pocket on the west side of Cleveland and it goes dark, they're upset about it. The good news is we have these repeater stations one of which is the former classical station, 104.9, which just carries a, our programming. So, and it's really only good real close to Cleveland, but if you're getting a bad signal there and you switch to 104.9, it'll be better, but you need to know that. And that's, again, I think it's all a communications issue. 
Do you think that um, the public funding model has uh, applicability to other forms of media, such as on your mattress uh, advertising? We're about to find out. Um, you'll have someone here, I think, from American Journalism Project and Signal uh, later in the speaker series. Signal has launched um, a newsroom in Cleveland and Akron. Uh, they're looking at Cincinnati next. Um, that should be membership funded. It's right now mostly philanthropy. It's, it's people who are seeing the, the gap in the market because of the reduction in newspaper reporting and saying, we need to come in with some big money. But eventually, the sustainability of that is members have to pay. And so we've proven uh, for decades that that model can work. But for newer organizations, how difficult is that to, to make the value proposition that you're, you're different, needed, and worthy of support? And we keep fighting that battle every day. And there are a number, and not just Signal, but there are a number of these nonprofit newsrooms that are launching, some of which uh, failed quickly, which was very unfortunate, and some of which are finding ways to, uh, to be sustainable. And that's the, the key is, can we have a funding model that's not just advertising base and circulation base um, that isn't government funded? It's basically people pay for what they value. And I, I hope so, but we're, we're in the midst of that experiment right now. If your uh, business model includes uh, more interest maybe in this area, Cleveland in this area, would it make sense to have some affiliation with your local public radio station? Absolutely. We have some relationship now in that we launched something called the Ohio Newsroom. And the Ohio Newsroom is um, a collaboration of the major stations um, in Ohio, IdeaStream, WYSO, um, uh, WBXU in Cincinnati, WOSU in, in Columbus. YSO is in um, Youngstown, Yellow Springs. But we're the kind of the, we're leading that effort. We invited everyone to join. Some of them are, they're members of this consortium, but in a way that basically is they can take, they can take programming from us. And we started a thing called uh, Today from the Ohio Newsroom. It's a feature that we run every day on all of our stations. It's offered to Youngstown, to Toledo, which doesn't do any local news. So there's at least that beginning of a relationship but it's not like I can call the news director at, at, at YSU because they're not, that's not what they do. But at some point, yes, as we start to look at new models and new ideas and how could we cover this region, could YSU be a place where we could get funding and staff an editor and two reporters and they could be part of that and, 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 and work together? We're in an era of collaboration. No one can afford now, in my view, to go it alone when the plane dealer, when Tom and I were there, I think we had 450 people on the editorial staff. They have something like 50 now or 60. Um, the, the numbers aren't there. So with our shop, and I think we have about 42 staff total in content, with our shop and the nonprofit here and the television station there and the Beacon Journal and those others, we need to be together uh, and collaborate. And I think when we do that, we'll, we'll replace the, that sucking sound of, of people having left the business. Yes, sir. I'm curious, since you mentioned WISU and you mentioned you were in the news local news as well, uh, have you ever accepted feedback as far as developing something like that in your shop? Yeah, I, I, I have not. Um, and I, I'd ask our, our business folks if they had, um, but I don't know the answer to that. Thanks. Yeah, I think there's probably a reason they don't do news. It's expensive, as I can tell you. We spend a lot of money on reporters and, and all the work that we're doing. It pays off and it's worthwhile. But there are some stations that they'll take the programming from NPR, play classical or jazz, and that's they'll call it a day. We do that with different stations. But um, I think it's always, it always comes down to, to the money. <laughs>